You know, when we're, when we're, when we're trying to win an argument, who do we have in mind? Ourselves. Right. We're trying to win something. This is not about winning an argument. No. It's about guiding someone to, uh, to discover an answer, you know, to a question. That's what it's about. Welcome, everyone, to the Full Life Podcast by Grace Church, where we hope to inspire, challenge, and clarify your next steps in faith. I'm Micah Boggs, and today we're going to be talking about a topic of tough questions in the Christian faith. This podcast is um, kind of based out of a sermon series that we're doing called You Asked For It, uh, where we're diving into questions uh, that people have in the Christian faith as well. And then we're going to try to hopefully equip people to be able to feel confident in answering those questions as well. Uh, today, I have someone really special with me, and it is going to be so awesome because you are probably pretty familiar with him um, on the hosting side, but this time he gets to be on the more speaking side. So today I have with me Pastor David Lawson. It is such a pleasure to be here with you. Thanks, Mike. I'm looking forward to our time together. I think this is a, this is a topic that is really going to help people. We all feel the pressure here mm-hmm. um, because we all want to get it right, and uh, hopefully we can help people out, uh, help them take their next step when they're in these conversations with people. Yeah. So one of the scariest things uh, that we face in our Christian faith is answering questions. We, we never know when uh, those questions are going to arise. Uh, they could happen in many different forms, and we don't want to answer those questions wrong to steer some, someone wrong, um, but we also don't want to get like upset mm. when someone asks us a question that feels a little bit badgering. And so I want to hopefully ease our feelings towards those types of questions. So how do we go about answering those types of questions? Yeah, I I think what you said there is key. Just take the pressure off because there really isn't any pressure. And hopefully as we have our conversation here today, uh, we'll all understand that the pressure we're putting on, we're just putting on ourselves. No one else is really putting on that pressure for the most part. I think maybe a place to start is to recognize that everybody has questions. You know, we all have questions. Even if you've been in faith for a long time, you got questions. Things come up. You read and you have questions. I wonder why it's like that. I wonder why he said that. You know, we, have, we have these questions. Questions are just a natural part of learning. They're a natural part of faith, just like anything else. We, we learn about faith. Sometimes we, we come to faith in Jesus Christ because we have an initial question, maybe about the purpose of life, the meaning of life. Is there more to my life? And we have these questions. Um, and then as we uh, continue to mature in our faith, we have more questions. I wonder why God is this way. I wonder what, what God's character is here. I wonder why Jesus said it this way. I, I want to learn more about the future. We have these questions that come up. So questions are just a natural part of making progress in learning and growing. Anybody who's had a toddler hmm. in, their, in their house knows that questions are part of learning. That's how everybody learns. And as I was doing a little bit of research on this, I discovered that a lot of the questions that are Googled are faith-related questions. Oh, really? Yeah. So I, I had to Google <laughs> to find the answer. But uh, I, I came up with, you know, and, and you could probably come up with your own numbers depending upon which resource you use and so forth. But I was, it was interesting for me to learn that, you know, what is love? That, that's a really fundamental question. What is love? It was Googled like 5 million times a right, month. Right, right. So, I mean, that's pretty significant, and it's a pretty core value for us, and it's really a spiritual value. You know, who is Jesus? It, that's Google two million times a month. You would think in in the wow. West, now this is this is worldwide, of course, but you would think that in the West, where there are so many churches, and you have you're celebrating Christmas, and there's Easter, and so forth, that people would kind of wouldn't be googling that question. They'd already have their own idea form, but they're probably looking for, you know, who is this authentic Jesus? They might know a Christian. They're thinking, I wonder who this Jesus is that he follows. And so they're googling who is Jesus some 2 million times. They they want to know. They want to wow. find out. Who is God? What is life? Those are those are googled like 1 million times a month. That's pretty significant, you know. People want to understand, you know, what is life? What is my life about? Who is God? I keep hearing people talking about God and God we trust, you know, all that kind of stuff. And a lot of a lot of the political things that are going on today are centered around faith or around God, or there's a faith position on it. And so people are wondering, you know, why, do, why does my friend hold this position, this moral position? 
Questions like, who am I and what is truth? These are some of the most fundamental questions that people can ask, and they're Googling them. They're going to Google for the answers. But there are times when they come to us for the answers because they have a relationship with us. And so the list goes on and on and on about the number of questions that people might be Googling or asking about faith. And they're good questions. They're fundamental questions. And they just they just really want to know the answer to what those are. I mean, it's just a natural part of learning and, and growing. Yeah. And hopefully by the end of this series and even this in this podcast uh, groupings that we're doing, people will feel like these are softball yeah. questions. Yeah, right. An an entryway into sharing your faith and your testimony yeah. of who Jesus is and and what He's done in your life. Yeah, one of the challenges I think, Micah, that we have, and maybe one of the reasons, uh, if you're a follower of Jesus, one of the way one of the reasons we feel pressure about this is because I'm going to use this. I'm, I'm carefully using this word, the narrative that's mm-hmm. out there about how the church and how Christians answer these questions. Now. The prevailing narrative, I think, out there is that we don't handle them very well. Hmm. Now, it might be just a minority of people don't handle them well, or um, a minority of the greater church representation doesn't handle them well. That could be the case, and then there's this narrative out there now that um, we're too harsh, or we're too dogmatic, or you know, we don't have the right disposition when someone asks us an honest question. Um, I don't know, but I don't know what whether that is the prevailing uh, rule or not, or whether mm-hmm. it's just something that's out there. But I think that complicates it for us, and I think that's one of the reasons that we feel the pressure on it. And so that's a pro- that's a real problem that we face, and uh, we can come across as too harsh, or we can come across as too defensive or too resolute. And I think one of the things that we need to keep in mind is that. We need just to assume that people are asking questions because they're interested. Yeah, you know they don't. They might not have a bone to pick. They right. just really want to know. And there are plenty of resources out. Think about this. There are plenty of resources out there for people to look for the answers to these questions. But they're asking you. Yeah, and they're asking me why because they have a relationship with you and they have a relationship with me and they really want to know what you think and what I think about these questions. Right. So how do you think that we can get away from this? I would say stereotype mm. um, or even uh, something that the media has portrayed a little bit differently um, or that some people have been hurt by church. How do you think that we can get away from that those type of feelings that people have? Well, I think gratefully we have some examples and we have some instruction. Um, this past weekend, Pastor Nick uh, began addressing this question with how Jesus answers questions. And mm. uh I, I thought there were some really good points in there from Jesus' life that I think would be helpful to anybody who's listening. And so if they if you haven't listened to that that message, I encourage you to go to um, graceforohio.org, find that message and listen to it because it'll be a, a great starting place. Yeah. I think there's another place though too. Uh, one of Jesus' apostles, Peter, he wrote two letters in the in the New Testament. His first letter is First Peter, and he gives us some instruction there that I think is really helpful, and I think I want to. We'll look at that today. Uh, the interesting thing about this letter that Peter wrote is that it's written in a time of severe persecution mm. for the churches, and yeah. I mean really severe persecution. It's not. It's not persecution like no thank you or you're being made fun of. People are dying because yeah. of their allegiance to Jesus Christ. Right. It's during a time of Emperor Nero. And the Christians were being blamed for everything, all the wrong that was going on in Rome. They were really hated, and they were literally dying because of their faith, because they uh, had, they were publicly making a statement that they were a follower of Jesus Christ. Mm. And the martyrdom was horrific. There were creative ways that people were dying because of their faith, because they were so hated, and. Uh, it's so gruesome. The, the, the martyrdom was so gruesome. You just don't even want to think about it. You don't even want to talk about it. And so this is the context that Peter is in and the church is in when he writes this letter. And so what he's saying is, uh, look, I know it's hard. He's not being flippant about it at all. He said, look, I know it's hard. It's difficult. You're probably wondering, how in the world are we going to get through all of this? Right, yeah. And he reminds them of something. Hmm. He says, yes, this is hard. And yes, this is difficult, but don't forget, you're a part of another kingdom, 
uh, you live for someone else. You have been transformed by the grace of God. There's a transformation that's happened. There's a change that's happened in your heart. You're going to you're going to live differently, and you're going to talk differently from everybody else. And my encouragement to you, this is Peter speaking, um, I'm paraphrasing, my encouragement to you <laughs> is to stay the course. Yeah. Live like no one else and speak like no one else so you can make a difference like no one else. Right. And so the first two and a half, um, the first two and a half chapters of this book, he's talking about what does life look like for someone who is living in persecution Mm -hmm. among a culture that is antagonistic to your faith. And then about halfway through the book in uh, chapter three, verses 15 and 16, if you're a student of the scripture, you'll probably remember uh, seeing these verses before. But he says in chapter three, verses 15 and 16, he's saying, look, after you've lived this way, there's going to be questions that are going to be asked, why in the world are you living this way? why Why do you think the way that you think? And so the question is going to come up, and Peter gives this instruction. He says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ will be ashamed of their slander. What a great challenge. It's a great challenge. It's an incredible challenge. And I want you to think about this. Christians are under this are facing the severe persecution. And the instruction that Peter gives is not run for your life, it's live a different life. Yeah. That's what he's saying. And he's saying literally persecution is your platform for proclamation. That's a remarkable thing. Right. You know, when when we think about the circumstances that we're living in and yes people are becoming more vocal about their antagonism to faith. We tend to want to like recoil. We tend to want to go into our shell. And and if Peter were instructing us, they were saying, no, 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 no. This is the time. This is the time to come out of your shell. This is the time to to make a statement, not just with how you live, but by but by also what you say. Yeah. And uh, this is a platform for you. And I can probably make the case. Um, that in Peter's letter here, he's not just saying that persecution is a platform for, for proclamation. He's saying that your primary concern during persecution should be proclamation. Right. Because that's when your life shines the brightest. I just, I just think that's remarkable. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like a challenge to say you're, you're standing firm. Yes. It is a call to stand firm and, and be a light in the people's lives mm-hmm. that may not have that light and have... Um, not not the hope that we have, right. um, but we don't probably face persecution the same way that right. they faced back then. I mean, the worst someone could probably say to us is like, "Okay, well, your God isn't real, and mm-hmm. we don't believe this, and how dare you be such a hypocrite?" Things like that. So, how do we deal with things that aren't as it, with the intensity is not it's not like quite right. the same. Right. So how do we how do we deal with that and how do we go about answering those questions without feeling like right. oh my gosh I have to be super defensive I'm going to get heated because that that's going to lead us nowhere right Yeah, I think our first response is to rejoice <laughs> because you know we're not in that situation where uh, it's much milder here but we're just not used to it I mean no one likes to be put on the spot no one likes to feel like they don't have an answer to a question that they think they should have the answer to Yeah, and so that's why I think a lot of the pressure we put on it is really ourselves it's not the other no. Most people, there are some that, that you have a good relationship with. I'm, not talk, I'm talking about people who have a good relationship with you. Yeah. Most of the time, they're not trying to put you on the spot. They're, they're <laughs> just trying, not. you know, there are people who you're going to get in conversations occasionally where you're going to be put on the spot. You know, that, that happens. But so I think the first response is we should rejoice. But I, th- I think the instruction that Peter gives to us here uh, first is relates to our disposition toward others. Hmm. And the reason I say that, even though it's toward the end of this instruction from these verses that I read, he said, um, but do it with gentleness and respect. I'm going to push it to the front, not because it necessarily belongs there, but because it's kind of the easiest one for us to grasp at this point. Our general disposition toward other people should be one of love. Yeah. People need to know that we're for them. Yeah, I can. Yeah, they can have an answer to. They can have a question that I might not have an answer to, and I, I should be willing to welcome those questions because, as we talked about before, 
This is just a way that people learn. But my general inclination toward that person should be that I am for them. Right. And why am I for them? I'm for them because this journey that they're going on could be life transforming for them. And I might have the opportunity to be used by God to help them discover the most marvelous truth that will be the most transformative thing in their lives. And, and, and the greatest act of love I can have towards somebody else is help them discover what life is like uh, through the person of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness and hope that he offers, right? And so I should be for that person. I think when we have that inclination and we have that disposition towards somebody, the pressure goes way off. Oh, Yeah. It's yeah. like hitting the the relief valve on you know the, the the pressure valve and just releasing all the pressure. They don't feel the pressure. We don't feel the pressure. They feel like they have an advocate and not an adversary. We're not trying to win. An, when I love somebody, I'm not trying to win an argument. I'm trying to help them, you know. And so I think that's the first thing that we learned from Peter's instructions here is to have a disposition uh, of being for someone else. Um, you know, Jesus talked about it. And Paul talked about it uh, in Jesus' famous statement about when he was asked what the greatest commandment was. He said, it's to love. It's to love God and it's to love others. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Hmm. And then to love your neighbor as yourself. And he didn't really, he didn't really separate those two. He said, look, he, those two are like united. And yeah. then he went on even further about the importance of this. If, that, if, it, if coming from the mouth of Jesus isn't enough, and if putting God primary isn't enough... He hung something else on there. He said, and look, and all the law and the prophets hang on this command. And what, basically what he's saying is that, look, if you get these two things right, if you understand what it means to love God and you're growing in your love for God with everything that you are, and if you love others and you're really putting the interests of other people above your own, you get what that God is trying to communicate right. to you. You're yeah. understanding what his primary message is. And that message is to be for other people. I feel like... Because God has done so much for us, that Jesus has done so much for us, mm. that we should love him so much that the the first commandment should be easy. Yeah. We, we, we should submit to that love and love him back for all that he's done for us. But then when you realize what Jesus has done for you, it makes it so much easier to just be like, I need my family, my friends, my coworkers, anyone I know to know this and experience this mm. same love that God has for us. Yeah. And for me, I think that's that's transformational. Yeah. yeah, and I think for it to be transformational, it has to be fundamental. In other words, it has to be to the core of who we are because otherwise I'm, I'm exercising willpower mm. to be gentle and respectful. If I already love that person and I want what's best for that person, I don't have to try anymore right. because it's my disposition. You know, Paul even talked about this. He didn't... Uh, use Jesus' words, but use Jesus as an example. And what what Paul said was, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. You know, when we're when we're when we're trying to win an argument, who do we have in mind? Ourselves, right? We're trying to win something. This is not about winning an argument. No, it's about guiding someone to uh, to discover an answer. You know, to a question. That's what it's about. So he says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility. What does that mean? That's putting the interest of the other person above my own, right? Yeah. So rather in humility, value others above yourselves. Each of you should not be looking to your own interests, but to the interests of the other person. Yeah. What is the interest of the other person? They want to know the answer to this question. Yeah. They, they want to know the answer to a question that could transform their life or be a gateway, a, a door that opens up to helping them discover what it means to have life in Jesus Christ. And so more than an inclination, more than a goal, our inclination, our prevailing disposition, I think this is really helpful. I think this is good words from Peter, gentleness and respect. Our prevailing disposition should be that we are for that person yeah. and that we love that person. I think that just is so huge and it just takes so much of the pressure off. Yeah. And this actually makes me think of uh, other opportunities when we were talking about, when you were talking about the humility and coming at uh, a question or a response with humility. Kind of reminds me of what we've talked about before on the podcast. Um, we, we had a series before this, um, a summer series of exchanging the life you yeah. had for the life that you want. And, and so part of that humility and that, that 
that change comes with your posture. And so if you want to go back and watch those, I, I think those would be really beneficial to you. Um, but what else can we, what else should our disposition be? We're, we're, our disposition is toward people, for people. Mm-hmm. What, what else should it be? Yeah, I think uh, that's the second instruction, which is the first one that, that Peter gives. And that is, what, what should our disposition toward God be? Hmm. Um, he actually leads with that. And uh, I think it's just really important. And so what he said in verse 15 is he says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to revere Christ as Lord? We probably haven't, uh, we can probably come up with our own understanding about what we think that means. It means set, a, you know, set him apart as Lord, you know, have him be primary. You know, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God, have those be. But it's interesting that Peter leads, in, and all those are true, but it's interesting that Peter leads into this with an Old Testament quote. So in verse 14, he says, do not fear their threats, do not be frightened. And if you have a study Bible or if you have a Bible that has references in it, you're going to see that's a quote from Isaiah chapter 8. And so if we can, if we can discover what Peter... In other words, Peter is using that quote for a reason. He's saying, hey, as it was when this quote was that I'm, I'm pulling, I'm citing was made, this should inform you about what this means to revere Christ as Lord yeah. in your life. And so the setting for this is that uh, Isaiah is the prophet, um, and there were other major prophets like Jeremiah who were also um, warning Israel about that and informing Israel. Uh, Israel, and this there were two kingdoms. There was the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom. There was Israel, and there was Judah. And the problem during this time was that the Israelites were counting on foreign kings, foreign earthly kings, and foreign people for their security. They felt threatened, yeah. and they felt like their their um, uh, the threat was imminent, and so they wanted to enter into these agreements with these foreign kings and these foreign people. And by doing so, they felt that they could buy their allegiance and that they would have their security. Prophets like Isaiah and their Jeremiah said, no, 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 you don't want to do that. This is not a good thing. Why? Because you don't want to trust, this is really important, you don't want to trust in earthly kings and earthly people for what you should be trusting God for. Right. And that's why the that's where the quote comes in because what what God is doing is he's coaching Isaiah about how to respond when his countrymen hate them, hate hate him because he's almost like uh, in their eyes committing treason right. that you're against us right. on this. And so God is coaching him and he's saying, "No, no, no, you're right on this." He said, "Hang in there." He's saying, "Do not call conspiracy everything this people calls a conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear and do not dread it. The Lord Almighty is the is um is the one you are to regard as holy. He yeah. is the one you are to fear." Yeah. That's what Peter is drawing on. He's saying, "You should not have you you should not be fearful or concerned about the naysayers." Right. Your allegiance should be. To it's, God. Al- it's almost like there's, a, there's this consistent pattern through pattern throughout history of us constantly trying to trust in something that isn't going to last. Right. How many times have you seen these kingdoms come and pass, yep. leaders come and pass, and, and we put our trust in them? And I feel like this is a good encouragement to us because you're not only setting your mind on heavenly things, but your desires are going to become mm-hmm. heavenly because you want to see people come to know yourself and others come to know uh, God in a, in a real tangible way yeah. and not just relying on our own understanding, what we can do. And we're never going to be able to answer any questions, be able to approach any situation if if we're just constantly trying to rely on what right. our abilities are. Right. And so I think that this is a, a great encouragement for that as well. Yeah. And I think you're right. You know, part of, again, releasing the pressure is to realize I'm serving someone else. Uh, I'm not serving myself. I'm serving the other person, but I'm also serving God. Yeah. Loving God, loving others. Loving yeah. God, loving others. I mean, that's, that's, that comes into play here. And what, what God was telling Isaiah here, look, I know you're feeling the pressure, but you have to feel that, the, that displeasing me is worse hmm. than displeasing other people. Right. If you feel that displeasing other people is worse than displeasing me, then you're not revering me 
as Lord in your heart. But if you if you believe that displeas if if in your heart you have set it to uh, set it toward that displeasing me is worse than displeasing other people, then you are refearing me in your heart. And so the bottom line is, if I were to, if I were to summarize what I think God is telling Isaiah here, and that what, what P- Peter is pulling into this instruction for us is that we need to trust the trustworthiness of God. Amen. If we trust the trustworthiness of God, then we, here's what we believe: we believe that He's going to use us as the guide in this conversation. We believe that He has the interest of the other person in mind. Right. We believe He has our interests in mind, and we believe by faith, that he's going to use this conversation for his honor and for his glory, regardless of how we think it goes. Right. We have to trust the trustworthiness of God. That's what it means to revere um, Jesus as Lord Mm. in our hearts, is to trust his trustworthiness, because he is trustworthy. And if we get to the point where we start feeling like we need to compromise, we start going back in our shell, we're not moving forward when the Lord gives us the opportunity, then we're not we're not trusting the trustworthiness of God in our lives. Right. So what what does this look like? Do you have any examples of how this this looks like in in our lives and how we should be going about this, especially I mean it's hard for us to think, oh man, trustworthiness, and yeah. it's easy just to submit to all this. Is, yeah. is there any things that, like examples that you have? Well, that? I got a lot of examples where it went wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I was, uh, after I graduated from college, I went to work for a, a uh, international chemical company that, that synthesized uh, herbicides, and I was in the primary herbicide group where I, I, I synthesized all the newly, or I didn't, I tested all the newly synthesized chemistry for herbicide activity. One so up the chain, and so um, I was the primary screen, and then those those that passed my screen went to the next one, and those that passed that screen went to the next one. So about four four up, four rungs up, there was this guy who found out I was a Christian. Big guy. I mean, he was mm-hmm. a massive. He was like six seven, probably three twenty. Big guy. Man, I think he actually played football. Wow. In college, and uh, he found out I was a Christian, and. It was like a heat-seeking missile. Missile. At least that's how I felt about it. I mean, right, he came. Yeah. He came right at me, and he started quoting stuff. Not quoting. Uh, he he started misrepresenting stuff from the Old mm. Testament. I was. I mean, I'd been in, in faith for a long time, but I can't say that I was as studied up as I needed to be on mm. what I believe and why I believe it. And he was talking about why did God allow all these killings that are going on in, in the Old Testament, just wiping out entire groups of people, and this and that and the other thing. Clearly, he didn't have a good understanding of the justice of God and um, and the the sinfulness of man and those sorts of things that would that enter into uh, an answer to that kind of question, but. It's like I felt like he was coming after me. This was not a friendly mm-hmm. conversation like we've been talking about. This was yeah. one he was trying to put me on the spot, and he was older than I was, and he was more experienced than I was. He was a lot bigger than I was. <laughs> and it was like at the time I wouldn't have been able to label it this way, but I knew this was one of those moments I just had to be faithful, and I had to trust mm-hmm. in the trustworthiness of God. And I think there was even a point where I said, you know, I don't know all the answers to your question. But yeah. here's something I do know. God loves you. God loves me. God loves all mankind. And even though I don't have the answer to this question, in the grand scheme of things, in the wisdom of God, uh, uh, he worked out his best for his glory. That's all I know. Well, that was not a satisfactory answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I... Tr- I can't even. I couldn't even tell you that I would. If you were to ask me, did you trust in the trustworthiness of God? I would, <laughs> Probably not. I just said what I thought. But... That act of faith probably was that. Well, I think that your the your attitude in response towards him is what what was the difference? Because yeah. without faith, your yeah. your attitude and response probably wouldn't have been that way. I, I could sense this uh, this the shift in your voice as, as you were telling yeah. the story, and I could I and I know you well enough that you dial back really really yeah. well. And I, I think a lot of I know a lot of believers um, uh, confidently in this church and in my life that will do the same thing if if a moment gets heated and we we have the trustworthiness and we trust in that of 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 Jesus of God um, that we're able to have a, a yeah. calmer I, I feel like he gives us this calmer spirit. Well, Micah, here's uh, the to thing to dial it back. This isn't an academic exercise. This is a spiritual ex- exercise. Hmm. People are lost 
you know, and, and they're, they're coming to us as imperfect as we are and maybe as ill-prepared as we are. They're, they're coming at us and they're considering us a safe place. Yeah. You know, and it's like, how am I going to handle that? Well, I want to handle that as a friend. Yeah. You know, I want to handle that as somebody who's for them. And part of trusting in the trustworthiness of God is recognizing that those relationships are just as providential as anything else. And I just need to move forward in faith with that. There was a guy that uh, I and another person in our church uh, were witnessing to. He came to our church and man, he was like, he's one of those full tilt guys. I mean, he was like all in on everything. And uh, he came from a Catholic background and uh, he just had a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. There were some things about his faith he didn't understand. There were some things about our faith. I mean, how we practice faith that he didn't understand. A lot of questions. And uh, so... And, and it became clear during the conversation that he didn't have a relationship with Jesus. He really wasn't mm. trusting in the forgiveness of Jesus uh, for, for his forgiveness and for his life. And so we were, we were talking to him. This was an ongoing conversation for months, yeah. really. And uh, one day he said, why don't you come over and I just want to just want to talk to you a little bit more about this. And so I drove over to his house. He was mowing the grass. And I drove up. He turned off the mower, went inside. We got some water. He leaned up against the cabinet, so I leaned over the, the, the island bar that was in his, uh, in his kitchen. And I said, so, so what's up? Where are you? And he said, Dave, he said, uh, I understand what, what you're saying. And, and I get what you're talking to me about. He said, but you need to understand, I'm Irish Catholic. <laughs> and he said, if I make this commitment and I pursue this way of life, of really following after Jesus, I'm turning my back on my whole family. Hmm. I'm going to be an outcast from my family. Now, that's a different side of trusting the trustworthiness of yeah. God. And um, he didn't make a commitment right then, but later on, my friend um, invited him to read John chapter 3. He was going on a, This guy was going on a business trip. And uh, as he was flying, he said, he encouraged him, when, you, when you're flying, just read John chapter 3. Yeah. He read John chapter 3 in the 28,000 feet, 32,000 feet, whatever it is, he gave his life to Jesus Christ. Wow. Um, that's, a, that's incredible. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> and so here's a guy, my, my point in telling you that story <clears throat> is that, you know, there were, there were two people who were counting in the trustworthiness of God. It was me and it was him. He was yeah. trying to figure it out. Yeah. And he had a lot of questions, and we were just answering those questions as best we could, and perfectly as we could, you know, sometimes it was imperfectly, but we just tried to keep trusting God with it. Yeah. And I think because of your relationship yeah. together and what you've right. uh, established there, I think that's huge um, because it, it, he knew that you were for right. him. Right. And, and so going back to that idea, if it wasn't for that, he probably wouldn't have started asking those questions in the first place. Um, I just have one short story, but I I had a friend in my life who um, he he's been hurt by church Mm -hmm. and faith. uh, And he, anytime he'd ask questions in faith, he'd have people hurt him Mm -hmm. in in their response. Like you're doing things wrong. I can't believe you're asking these questions. Your lifestyle is so hypocritical. How dare you? And he came to me um, after he moved back home because he moved away for a while and he started asking me questions, and uh, I, I was just wanting to have a casual conversation mm-hmm. with him. Mm-hmm. And he was like, I have never heard anyone respond with as much love as you have mm-hmm. it, about faith. And yeah. it, it makes me want to learn more. And so through that, I've been able to have better conversations right. because of that. And, and it just reminds me about the, the going back to the example of being for people. And, right. And that story is a great example of it. And, mm-hmm. and even... The trustworthiness. That's right. So, um, I want to switch gears for a second and and kind of move into this next step stage mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. because we can talk about this all day. Um, but I like the practical next steps yeah. of like, what am I supposed to do about right. what I'm learning? So, right. um, what are some next steps that we can take out of this? Well, I, I think um, a lot of this is just going to be a re- reiteration of what we've been talking about. But I think it, it really is important, like because Peter leads with this. That's why I think it's important, um, this idea of revering Christ as Lord. I think the first next step for us is to regularly affirm Hmm. our trust in the trustworthiness of God. I'm going to trust His trustworthiness. You know, you might have to 
um, maybe memorize some verses, and you might have to rehearse this over and over in your mind. You know, Hebrews ten twenty three says, uh, "Let us hold unswervingly to the faith and the mm-hmm. hope that we profess, because he who promises is faithful." And so we're holding on to this hope. Why? Because he who promises is faithful. He's going to be faithful. And and Peter says to be prepared to give an answer for the reason for the hope that you have. Yeah. And so I'm going to hold on to that. I'm not going to release that. I'm not going to compromise that. I'm going to live that in a gentle and loving and respectful way in front of people that I know and that I love. And uh, how I walk and how my talk is going to be different because I'm holding unswervingly to this. Why? Because he who promises is faithful. Amen. And when I have a conversation with him, I got, have to reaffirm his faithfulness in my life. So I think the first thing is just to regularly affirm our trust in God's trustworthiness. That's good. I think that's the first one. What else? The second one for me would be to, you know, just to start learning more about your faith. Yeah. You know, it's an easy thing to do, uh, and it's an easy thing to get on autopilot. It's like, think, well, I'm going to church and I'm in a grace group or whatever it might be, uh, and so I'm good. Well, maybe. Um, I'll never forget I had, uh, I got a phone call one time from a cousin of mine who's, uh, whose dad, my uncle, had died. And, uh, you know, we were in a particular series at the church and we were um, studying something, having a conversation about something else in a grace group. And so, you know, I had this going, I was regularly, and, my, and I was reading the Bible regularly in my devotional time. Mm-hmm. Neither, church is important. My grace group is important. My regular devotional life. Those I re- highly recommend those be a part of every aspect of, yeah. your, of your life. Those things did not answer the question that I was asked. Mm. The question I was asked was, can you give me some hope? Where is my dad? His dad came from a background where he probably didn't have, he didn't have faith in Jesus Christ. And I could not honestly answer that question by saying, well, your dad's in heaven, because that wasn't true. Mm. How do I answer that question with gentleness and respect? In a trusting relationship, my cousin, you know, called me and he asked me because I'm a safe place. Yeah, he said, "Give me some hope here." Well, I couldn't give him that hope, but what hope do I give him? If I'm not studied up, if I haven't learned more, if if I'm not further investigating my faith and understanding where, and even understanding where people that I have relationship with are are in their own faith, I can't answer that question very well. Right. And so learn more about what you believe. Know what you believe and know why you believe it. That's the place I would start, you know, learning more about who God is, knowing more about who Jesus is. What do I believe about the Holy Spirit? What do I believe about the church? What do I believe about these things? What do I believe about sin? What do I believe about salvation? How do I explain this to somebody? Yeah. And then on top of that, what questions are people asking yeah. in the culture? You know, um, a a lot of times people in the culture aren't asking questions that people of faith are asking. Right. And if we're going to be as a light shining in the darkness, we need to know what questions people are asking and, and give them hope by having some sort of answer for those questions and directing them to the right answer. Yeah. So I think the first one is trust in the trustworthiness of God. And I think the second one is uh, learn more about your faith. Learn yeah. uh, what and why you believe it. And, and what better to go back and make sure, hey... Go and watch these sermons yeah, right. on our website because these are going to be the the thing that we we need we need the answers to, mm-hmm. and, and that we're going to be answering some of these questions that um, that people have. Yeah. And so hopefully later on in this podcast as well, we'll be able to answer some questions yeah. that weren't answered right. as well. So making sure that hey, if you come back and you don't know. Um, this is a great opportunity yeah. for us to dive into those questions and right. how to answer them. Yeah. So, there's one more that I think is really important that I want to I want to talk about, Micah, and that is look at yourself as a guide hmm. more than an authority. Yeah, I think this takes a lot of pressure off too. If I don't feel like I've got to be the academic authority, that I have to be like the encyclopedia of knowledge, the Wikipedia of all these, you know questions that people have about faith, it takes a lot of pressure off. And I yeah. think that's legitimate to be can look at yourself as a guide rather than as a, an authority. Because a guide leads you someplace. A guide walks with you. He's not handing down an edict top down. It's not, no, I'm going to walk with you through this. Even if you know the answer to the question, help that person discover that answer for themselves. Yeah, you can give your opinion. Yes, you can lead them to scripture. And yes, you can talk about 
you know, an answer to their question, but you're involving them in the process. You know, uh, Julie and I like to hike a lot, and uh, we have, there's this app called the All Trails app, <laughs> and uh, you can look up a trail, and as long as you have service, uh, cell service, you can. There's a blue dot that follows that that trail. But as soon as you get out of service, which happens a lot in the mountains, oh yeah, uh, it's like, okay, where are we? And now <laughs> I'm looking for some really good signs, you know, uh, to to take me. Well, that's what a guide is. Yeah, a guide is the blue dot on the map. And a guide is the good is the signs that people can follow along the way, and that's an, that's another way of demonstrating I'm for you, and I'm an advocate for you, and I'm going to learn some things along the way right. along with you. It goes back to that that humble yeah that humble aspect yeah just it. because you're just because you're a Christian and a follower of Jesus Christ doesn't mean you know all the answers. It doesn't mean you shouldn't be pursuing them. Yes, you should be pursuing them, but you know, you don't have to know everything. To become a follower of Jesus, you just have to know some things. You have to know that you're a sinner. You have to know that your sin separates you from God. You have to know that God reconciled us through the person of Jesus Christ, and that you can, and as a result of that, you can live forever uh, in a relationship with God. That's not everything you need to know, right. but that's all you need to know in order to enter into a relationship with Jesus. Right. 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 And so once I beat that. Entering into a relationship with Jesus and knowing about who God is, knowing about who I am, knowing about who Jesus is, and understanding what faith is about is just the beginning. Right. Now I can be learning more. And when I consider myself to be a guide rather than an authority, I give myself permission to keep learning along with the people who are asking me questions. Yeah. I think this is going to be a great um, uh, series for people to, to so. dive into. And um, I hope that you're encouraged by this. I hope that you learned something from this. Uh, and I hope our time together was was good. Um, I'm so glad that we were able to have this conversation. And I'm glad that you guys were able to uh, sit in and listen into this. Um, and I hope that your, your faith has been strengthened because of this. And just remember that Jesus came, that we may have life and life to the full. <laughs>